Hey guys, welcome back. Special episode, one I've wanted to do actually probably since we started the channel. I'm here with my buddy Travis Stromness. He is an active Ontario CO officer, so conservation officer. Not only does he do that, he's also an avid fisherman. I'll put some links below to his socials. He's a very active bass fisherman, got a lot of really cool content, but we had a lot of questions in the comments about some of the just regulations, concerns that musky fishermen have, especially up here in Shield Lake. So I invited Travis to come on. I'll let him kind of introduce himself and then we'll we'll kind of start with some of your guys' questions. So Travis, welcome. Right on. Glad to be here. Thanks a lot for the invite. Uh, so my name is Travis Strumness. Uh, as Glenn mentioned, I'm a conservation officer with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. I live here in Dryden, Ontario, up in Sunset Country, Northwest region. Uh, I've been up here for eight years now. I grew up locally-ish from the Fort Francis area, um, and Dryden is uh, now where I call home. Perfect. So where Travis grew up is actually where my wife's family is originally from, so that Stratton, Nemo, Rainy, yeah. Rainy River area. So he's pretty much a home body like we are. So he's very familiar with the region and then also very familiar just being a CO officer. So one of the big things, Travis, that always comes up this time of year is we're going into open season for walleye in mm -hmm. northwestern Ontario. And we're still, as of today's filming, we're 30 days out of muskie season. So that's when the season starts for, for us. Right. We're all about the muskies. Right. Yep. But because the camps are opening... People are coming out, they're going to be fishing for walleye, and one of the biggest things that happens every spring is incidental catches of muskie. How often do you see that? So it happens a lot. So there's going to be a pile of people out on the landscape this weekend uh, once our walleye season opens, and guaranteed several times throughout the day, uh, people are going to run into muskies incidentally because they're chasing walleyes and their post-spawn habitat directly correlates and crosses over with the spawning habitat of a muskie. Yeah, absolutely. It happens to us. We're probably going to go bass fishing in the next week or two as the bass move up shallow. We always run into muskies. In fact, we did a quick, just a, a phone video a few years ago where we just water released one at the side of the boat. And that brought up some questions at that time on what constitutes possession of an out-of-season fish. And the second part of that question is... What happens when somebody takes an out-of-season muskie and takes a photo and posts it online or just has that photo and shares it? Well, that's Where's the law on those two, on you know, those two subjects? Right, so the, the uh, working term here is possession. So although possession is basically a very cut and dry uh, definition in itself, it does come with a little bit of leeway in terms of fishing and in the angling world. So more often than not, what we're looking at is intent. So if if you're going to be out fishing uh, at any given time during the closed season and you're going to catch incidentally, in this case, we're talking about muskie, um, it, it's bound to happen. What the important thing to, to keep in mind is, is how you react and how you act after you've hooked uh, these fish. What we... As much as, <clears throat> excuse me, as much as possession is, I don't have that, but now I have that. What we want to see is people that are incidentally catching musky uh, and any other species of a closed season is that uh, we appreciate that time, effort, and money has gone into purchasing the equipment and the gear and everything else that you, you've gone out uh, and used to angle for, whatever, whatever it is you're angling for. If you come across a musky incidentally, uh, what we want is for people to try and take the hook out boat side still in the water. It's really important, Glenn, to note that uh, this time of year, the spawn is inc incredibly, it's a lot of effort uh, in terms of musky, uh, right? They're a big fish, they're a powerful fish. They expend a lot of effort, a lot of energy uh, when it comes to their spawn. So keeping them in the water, keeping them full of oxygen uh, in that cold water is really important. So what you're saying with the first point there, Travis, is that because the fish are already stressed because of the spawn, you being a conservation officer want to see an angler try to release that fish in the water and do the least amount of external stress possible 
but there's going to be situations where they may have to put a fish in the net to safely remove their gear. Is that kind of where you're going with it? That's right, Glenn. So like I said, we appreciate that uh, we don't expect anybody to pull a muskie up to the side of the boat during the closed season and look at it and cut 10 feet of line off and have it swim away with all their gear. Uh, what we want to see is if you, if you need to use a net, if you have the proper equipment, uh, to unhook that fish safely, keep it in the water, and then it has to be immediately released. So that's the big thing. You can't possess it because it's a closed season. Immediately release means exactly that. You release it immediately. So what we don't like to see is excessive handling, right? If you got to have it over the edge of the boat in the water and you're playing with it, trying to get it to go just as, as uh, trophy fishermen do, that's great. That's what we want to see. You're doing your due diligence, making every effort to make sure that fish survives and swims away. But we don't want to see it coming out of the water. We don't want to see the glory shots. We don't want people passing it around the boat so everybody can get a photo with it. That That's not the time nor the place to be doing that. I would I would say that it's not proper to do that at any time, right? You, your first and foremost concern has to be the respect for the fish and respect for the fact that it's going through a tough time right now. Keep it in the water uh, as best you can, release it, and let it live on to reproduce. Yeah, and I think... From the musky, if I speak for the musky community as a whole, I think most musky anglers realize that those out of season fish, they're out of season for a reason, especially up here. We have the last opening in North America for muskies because our spawns are so late. So we we really try to not stress the fish, the fish out, pardon me. And the the point of, yeah, you have it in the water and maybe you're trying to you know help it. Mm -hmm you know, settle down. If a guy takes a photo like that, that's not necessarily going to be an issue is that's kind of how I'm reading that. Yeah. So if you're taking, if you're taking your, you're doing your due diligence, right? We spoke about due yeah. diligence earlier. If you're doing what you can to ensure that that fish is going to survive and prosper. Uh, if you've got somebody else in the boat and they're taking a video while you're doing this or photos or, or clippings out of a video, that's totally fine. Like I said, it's those big trophy glory shots, you know, in the boat that that's what we don't want to see. Um, during the closed season, having them out of the water is detrimental to their spawn and they got it hard enough as it is to try and survive. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I appreciate that look on that subject and we'll kind of wrap that up there. We're going to kind of come back around to possession here in a bit, but let's move on to the next subject. Okay. Second thing that came up through the comments when I, I had asked the YouTube community about this, Travis, was invasive species. Mm -hmm. And that one really seemed to hit home because I think it was last fall that I actually called you. And David and I and Richard were out fishing on Canyon Lake and we were trolling around and it was cool. It was late in the fall. We reeled up to move to a new spot and the eyes of our rod, and I do believe I have some photos, I'll, I'll put them right here. And we just, we noticed something on our rods and our line and it just, it seemed very strange. We hadn't seen it before. Moved to another spot, same thing. And then we started looking at it. We're like, you know what? This looks like spiny water fleas. Let's keep some, let's get some in a bag. We did. I called Travis, I sent him a few pictures. He's like, yeah, that's spiny water fleas. And to their credit, within like three days, there was a sign up at the landing saying this body of water has spiny water fleas. So that one really hits home for me because it, not that I'm proud that we found it, but I'm happy that we were able to find it. You guys were able to get a sign up people, some awareness might come of it. So talk about some of the, you know, the invasive species that primarily will affect muskies, you know, as it relates to us. Absolutely. So, so yeah, I do, I do remember that last summer. So spiny water flea is something that's been spread through ballast water. Uh, has for years. There's regulations restricting all that now, but unfortunately it's here and it's here to stay. Uh, we do have signage up and and like you mentioned, we're, we're always tracking, the MNR is always tracking movements of these invasive species because they can be very detrimental. So spiny water flea specifically, um, it's one of those things, you know, those adult fish, it doesn't quite have such a great effect on it. Uh, but if you Google a picture or uh, Glenn's going to put a picture up of, of what he found and if you have a good look at it, you can see where they get their name from. So that spike that sticks out the back of them, they look like uh, something from Alien vs. Predator movie. Yeah, they absolutely do. And uh, it's it's hard on young fish. So those young of the year, uh, you know, those fresh spawn muskies and stuff, once they move to, to munching on, you know, um, bugs and small minnows and things like that, that's something in the water that they can tangibly see, right? And they're 
reading that. So there's two issues with it. Uh, those the prongs or the spines, as they're called, uh, can get lodged in the throat, and it can over time. And I'm not saying it happens all the time, but it can close up a a um, their throat, so they're unable to eat. So if they do manage to get them through, they're hard on their stomach. They're hard to digest. And of course, because it's an invasive species and it's learned so well to adapt, it can sit through the stomach and go through the digestive system. And the eggs can actually come out the backside of a fish and mm. still reproduce, um, which which is typical for an invasive species, right? They're always generally so robust. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The other the other thing we don't like to see is when they're small like that and those young of the year uh, fry, musky fry, w when they're eating those up, right, you got to think that their gills are opening and closing and all that water is pushing through there to keep them from suffocating. Well, if those things get stuck in behind those gill plates over top of those gill filaments, then essentially it's like putting a bag over your face, right? It's like they, drowning the drowning fish. the fish, essentially they suffocate. It's, it's exactly what it is. Yeah. And just to touch on that before we move on, that's something that particularly on that body of water. I talked to some of the Manitoba guys that come up and fish there. I kind of made them aware and we're going to try and be a little more diligent when we do catch some fish just to take a quick inspection, like you say, around, you know, the mouth, the throat, the gills within reason of, you know, not harming the fish. But there's there's an opportunity there to see if we can see any damage to these fish and whether we can do anything or not. Probably not, but we can at least report what we're seeing back to the MNR and to the biologists and hopefully any information helps, right? Yeah, absolutely. All information, right, whether it's acted on immediately, right in the case where you reported it last year and we had signage put up to notify other anglers, um, whether it's something done immediately or it's something that's looked at over a broad period of time uh, to try and affect a management strategy, uh, do what we can with what we have. So the more information, the better. Yeah, no, absolutely. And looking at Travis's sheet here, I'll just kind of lead us into the next one. And everybody knows rusty crayfish. I've seen it firsthand. My brother-in-law is a cabin on Eagle mm -hmm. Lake. And there was a popular spot not far from where he launches his boat, huge weed line. And in two years, completely gone. gone. I mean, not even a stock left in the water. So to most guys watching, they know what rusty crayfish do, but maybe just kind of describe, you know, what they do to a habitat and, and how detrimental they are. Yeah. So rusty crayfish, again, that's like a buzzword in the angling community. Everybody's heard of them. Um, they're, they're known for their big size, right? Some very obvious things. They've got the shell here and on the sides, there's two big spots and it, that's where they get their name because they're rust colored. Um, so they outcompete for forage. They're very aggressive. The females, they have the capability to hold the eggs underneath their tails and move around. So it makes the ability for them to spread uh, and, and expand their, their range of habitat that much greater and that much quicker. So one of the big things that Glenn, you just touched on is the destruction of spawning habitat. So as it relates to muskie, right, you we're looking, we're talking shallow weedy bays in the springtime, anywhere between April and June and all these invertebrates that are in the water, that's where the warm water is. So that's where they're going as well. That's where they're concentrating all their efforts as well. Uh, these things take down the natural forage uh, in these weedy bays. And ultimately, because just like any other species of fish, uh, muskies as well, they tend to go back to the same areas and spawn in the yeah. same areas that, that they had prior or that they were, uh, that they used to be fry in. So, Without that forage, without that uh, weed growth coming up, it leaves the muskies less and less habitat for them to effectively uh, engage in their spawn. Yeah, it's it's definitely a big problem. It, it's a problem through walleye fishing, bass fishing. It's one that it's very well known. So we'll kind of leave it at that for the rusty crayfish because I'm sure, like we said, everybody's kind of you know heard of them or encountered them. So let's move on to the next one. Okay, the next one, we had a couple questions about it, but it, it's definitely one that I've already talked to Travis probably a couple of years ago. I talked to the local biologist in Dryden about it, and it's monitoring our muskie populations. I know in the States, they do a lot of stalking because the muskies just don't naturally reproduce like they do here. And off camera, Travis and I were talking about this. So I'll let Travis kind of talk about 
why it is the monitoring and you know the studies are kind of what they are so just you can touch on that travis yeah so a big part uh, with with regards to uh, monitoring of musky populations so historically there was a lot of uh, a lot of data uh, during the the shift in the focus on muskies so back in the 70s and 80s the harvest uh, the kill harvest was was great it was it was huge uh, in terms of musky fishing, but that was back in the days where you, you couldn't afford to go out, right? Meat was yeah. meat, you had to put it on the table. Uh, since then, the the whole community of musky angling has changed tenfold. Um, so I've got some stats here that, that I did pull from, uh, from some stuff here. Um, so in Ontario, musky reside in over 300 lakes uh, and over 100 rivers. And believe it or not, the population that we have in Ontario is over, it's more than 25% North America wide. Yeah, right? I believe that. Yeah, so we, we're very fortunate here in the province of Ontario, and of course up here in Sunset Country, we are pretty spoiled. Yeah. And just a quick side note there, where I live, I'm an hour to Lake of the Woods, mm-hmm. I'm an hour to Lac Sewell, I'm five minutes from Eagle, I'm 20 from Wabagoon, I'm 20 from Cedar, and that's just the well-known lakes around here, never mind all the small ones that you can go to and catch muskies. So yeah, we're really fortunate Mm -hmm. where we live in sunset country. Yeah. So a lot of the most recent reports uh, from the tour, excuse me, the tourism uh, industry, um, when they were doing a lot of these studies back in the day, we'll say. uh, So they've learned that over 99% since that culture shift of, you know, kill and eat uh, has shifted to targeting, angling, catch and release and, and trying to have a species uh, um, continue to exist, there's upwards of 90, 99, over 99% uh, as far as tourism uh, accounts for rele- fish being caught, muskies being caught and released back into the water bodies. So if you think about that from what it used to be in the 70s and 80s, that's almost 100% of the fish that are being caught are being targeted with proper equipment and they're being released back in the water to continue their lives and for other people to catch. Um, mortality rates on incidental catches. Uh, so there isn't a lot of mortality with people that are actively angling for musky people, you know, Glenn, I watched some of your equipment stuff. You talk about the gear that you use and that is all the proper stuff to be yeah. using. Um, and it's important that people use the proper equipment, but that helps reduce mortality. A lot of the mortality comes from mishandling or overhandling. People are passing it around the boat or around okay. the dock to get their glory shot. Um, and also from using tackle that's too late. Um, so it's important to have the right gear when you're chasing, yeah. chasing these things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so because of that, uh, because of the shift change in the community and the focus and, uh, and the prize possession that is musky fishing as a trophy fishery, uh, there hasn't been a lot of really recent monitoring done on species up here in, in uh, sunset country. We're very fortunate. We don't see a lot of the external, uh, influences or factors, you know, the big farming and, you know, the development and uh, the destruction of waterways and stuff like that like you might see in other places or down in the U.S. So we're very fortunate that we haven't had that uh, that touch of uh, change up here uh, but it allows our populations to sustain themselves successfully um, and and be able to uh, continue to exist. Yeah and I think just to kind of touch on that all of you guys out there are doing the right thing. The musky community as a whole they value you know, the musky, they value mm-hmm. the catch and release aspect. Yeah, we're all guilty of wanting the grip and grin photos, but mm-hmm. we're all trying to do the right thing and the due diligence to get it back. Yeah, it's easy to point the finger at people with incidental catches, but in a lot of cases, that person that gets an incidental catch maybe had never caught a musky in their life. They might not even know what it is. Mm-hmm. So it's not fair to blame, you know, some mortality and stuff on them. I think that us as a community need to help educate other people on how to deal with those fish. But I think in Ontario, especially in sunset country, camp owners, guides, just the community as a whole, they value muskie in 2023 way more than they ever did. And probably I'll just put it at 1990, even as muskie started to get popular Mm -hmm. when I got into it really big in 2007, 2008, it was still, there was still a community was like, musky is just, uh, it's like a carp. They, they just did not value it. Yeah. And now, 
even though a mu the musky community and the musky business is small on the grand scheme of things, it's a very lucrative business. You look behind me and you see how much money can be tied up. So people do put a lot into it mm -hmm. and we put a lot into catch and release. So it's nice to see that from the government side that they don't really feel the need to do a lot of studies because we're so fortunate. We just have a lot of freaking muskies. Like yeah. that's awesome. So, you know, we're happy that everybody out there is doing the right thing. And we're happy that everybody locally, and I'm happy that when I run into you or any of your colleagues and they come and talk to us as musky anglers, they're usually pretty happy with what we do as a community. So I think that's like a win, win, win for mm -hmm. us. Yeah, the, the musky community as a whole, when you're looking at all different facets of fishing, all different species, um, right, they're just, conservation is key, and, and that's one thing that's continuously upheld by the anglers in the musky community. I see it day in and day out, all summer long when I'm out checking guys, and it's it's great to see. It's actually the fastest checks that I, that I do, because they're generally, you guys aren't fishing for anything else, you're just chasing the holy grail of fish swimming around in the water, and it's it's uh, it's good and and conservation being the top of mind i mean from our perspective from a from a standpoint you can't be can't ask for any better no absolutely all right we'll move on all right guys we're going to circle back to possession and conservation and what a conservation license is because i know a lot of americans come up and they're staying at a lodge mm -hmm. they're not going to take any fish home they might have a fish fry at camp they're going to fish for muskies for the week. So they just want to get the cheapest license. So a conservation license, which allows for zero possession, which again, you muskie guys out there, it's zero possession anyway mm -hmm. for us. But what does a conservation license actually mean for a muskie angler? Right. And so what I touched on earlier, Glenn, about the whole possession thing. Um, so this, that kind of plays into this as well. So, uh, in Ontario, we have two licenses. You've got your sport fishing license and your conservation fishing license. I can appreciate the difference in cost to people, especially if they're spending a lot of money to come up here and chase after these beautiful fish. That being said, uh, if you purchase a conservation fishing license to fish in Ontario, if you're in an area where there is an open season for that species, you can lawfully fish. So in turn, in here we're talking about muskie. If I went out tomorrow and bought a conservation fishing license, 100% I can go and chase muskies around. If you have a conservation license and you're out fishing and you, whatever fish you catch, it's got to go back immediately. That's kind of the ruling. Mm -hmm. I'll put a couple video clips here of Kyla's 52 and a quarter from Cedar last year. And we did just that. My we measured it she got a quick photo it went back into the water hey, and we chair. got video two of us taking video while she's mm -hmm. cradling that fish to revive it safely just and those are the best the actually the best shots of the whole thing that we have because you get that Babe, cool perspective that a of a fish in its natural yeah. habitat kyle is smiling those this. are the pictures and the videos oh, we always go back to good. as anglers and i'm not that? against uh, you know the grip and grin Without style of photo because they're very popular awesome. <laughs> but there's so much more you can do than just take that picture of the fish and keeping in mind what travis has said here a lot the health of the fish is paramount that should be your very first thing not how well your photo is going to look or how well you know your hair is or, or whatever it is we need to look after these fish so that my kids can fish for it your kids can fish for it and when you guys come up when you're a grandfather and you're bringing your grandkids so that these fish are there so just always always remember it's conservation catch and release get your photos or your videos where you can but like let's you know protect this species absolutely all right I'm, we're going to kind of wrap this up here and one of the things that guys had asked me asked travis for a couple stories without implicating anyone this the stories that you hear when you're doing a check i mean a big part of what i do is stories i love listening to stories if i didn't like talking to people and listening to <laughs> stories then i'm in the wrong career yeah. right um so i mean who if you're out there and you're a musky angler I can almost guarantee that everybody's heard of the story, you know, on the River Monsters show with Jeremy Wade, yeah. right? So not to say that I'm, I'm not going to discredit anything that he says on there, but I'll tell you right now, 
that when he's talking about stuff down in the Amazon and stuff like that, that I have no idea about, I look at that and I am enthralled. Like, I yeah. just can't believe it. So it was really interesting to see the different different perspective when he came up here yeah. to Eagle Lake chasing this, uh, this gigantic uh, water creature that's swimming around in the lake. Um, so I haven't, uh, I mean, musky, th- musky, ang- musky angling isn't one of those things where, you know, I pull up to a boat and I see that they have fish in the boat or in a live well, right? It's not like walleye or something that people keep to eat. Um, I do talk to a lot of musky anglers. And as I mentioned earlier, it's some of the, some of the best friendliest and the easiest checks that I have because I need to see a license, some safety equipment. That's pretty much it. Um, I love looking at the gear that your wall behind, behind us here is, this is just phenomenal. My jaw just about hit the floor when I walked through the door there. Um, there is one, there is one, and I will put a disclaimer out here. I am not a musky angler. I have caught muskies. I, um, I, I can't say with 100% certainty I'm in the 50 club, but I did have one that was 49 tape measure in the water at the side of the boat. And I spent another hour with it trying to get it to go away. Um, and it did. Uh, but there's, uh, there's one check that really sticks out and it was, uh, these, these two fellows were heading south on uh, highway 502. That's how you get back to the U S and, uh, they were from in Minnesota, beautiful. And I'm talking just gorgeous, shiny brand spanking new 21 foot Ranger boat, 300 R on the back. And I, and I stopped these guys and it is just like, I am walking up past this boat and I'm just about drooling. So they get out and they're happy to talk to me. Very, very friendly guys. They ended up being, uh, they were both pilots somewhere down in the States for a company. And I'm talking to them and no fish going home. They were up chasing muskies. And, uh, and I'll never forget this. Uh, and I said, oh, how'd it go? And they were just beside themselves. Best trip they've ever had. They were just, they could, they could not, grinning ear from, ear from ear to ear. And I said, awesome. I said, so you caught lots. And they said, we had eight follows and we put one fish in the boat <laughs> and it's the best year that we've had in five years. And I, and I looked at that and I looked at him and I smiled and as much as I, it's hard for me not being a musky angler to appreciate that, I do dabble in the tournament fishing for bass, right? So I spend money and yeah. time and everything else. So I get that side of it and I laughed I, and I just thought to myself, you know, musky anglers, a different breed, so focused and so fine-tuned to everything that's going on uh, in the in a, the system of a water body. Um, but yeah, very, very genuine fellas. Really, yeah. really great to talk to. That's a that's a common story. We get lots of guys that come up to Eagle. I'm like, how'd you do? Oh, like it was a tough week. We only raised like five or six, but we got like two. One was under 40 and one was like a 52 and they're happy. Yeah. And from a non-musky angler, it's just like, what is the point? Why would you do that? But there's nothing like bringing a big fish up to the side of the boat that you, we always call it hunting. You're hunting that yep. fish. It, it, Travis is a hunter as well. He can appreciate the, the, the trying to find the spot and, and all the viewers can too. And there's just something primal about going into a bay and trying to locate that fish, trying to trick it to bite and, I was going to wrap up and kind of roll this right around full circle. I was fishing solo on Indian Lake chain probably seven, eight, nine years ago. And I know that's kind of Travis's area. And that's actually where I'd probably met you was on Indian Lake chain at one time. I think it was. Yep. So I'm fishing solo and fishing a well-known kind of open water reef. I hook into what turned out to be a 45 inch muskie. And as I get it up and it kind of startled me right at the side of the boat, I get it in the net and I had the bump board, but I'm just like, what am I going to do? I I can't take a picture. Two camp boats are coming from Clark's camp, from Casey's Landing, actually. And they kind of pull over, and the fellow's like, hey, do you need a hand? I'm like, yeah, if you don't mind taking a quick picture for me. So I handed him my phone, and I just I got my bump board ready. I took a quick measurement, and I just held it up. I'll link that photo right here. But the really cool part was he's like, you just did everything perfect. And I was like, excuse me? He's like, oh, I'm a DNR officer from Minnesota. And he's like, that's exactly what we like to see. And I was like, oh, cool. He gave me his card and I've since lost it. I would have liked to have kind of reached out to him. But it just goes to show that whether he's a DNR officer in Minnesota or you're one here in Ontario, they're looking out for the fishery at heart, right? And that's what we're trying to do. And I think... If you guys like this, you know, this episode and you want 
you know, some more questions answered. It doesn't have to be Travis. I can maybe reach out to one of the biologists and, and maybe we can touch on a few more of these subjects. But truly appreciate Travis coming on and talking with us. I think this was helpful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always run into Travis from time to time, whether it's at my wife's shop or out on the water. And he's he's kind of like an encyclopedia for me. If I need an answer on something, I don't hesitate to call or text. And he, you encourage that, right? Absolutely. It's, uh, you know what, as much as this is a job and a career, um, it's more of a lifestyle. And always happy to stop, whether I'm working or not, uh, happy to stop, answer questions, anything like that. That's awesome. Well, Travis, I appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody's going to enjoy this episode. And as we get a few comments from you guys, we'll, I'll try and pass them along to Travis. So for now, 54 Bus is out of here. We'll catch you guys out on the water later.